Welcome back to Civic U. My name is Spencer Lemon and I'm the assistant coordinator for the CLC program at Lincoln Northeast High School. We're going to be continuing our reading of Howard Zinn's A Young People's History of the United States. This next chapter is going to feel very relevant and unfortunately very familiar. So with little introduction, let's dive into chapter 17, Black Revolt and Civil Rights. The Black Revolt of the 1950s and 1960s surprised white America but it shouldn't have. When people are oppressed, memory is the one thing that can't be taken away from them. For people with memories of oppression, revolt is always just an inch below the surface. Blacks in the United States had the memory of slavery. Beyond that, they lived with the daily realities of lynching, insults, and segregation. As the 20th century went on, they found new ways to resist. Fighting back. In the, in the 1920s, a black poet named Claude McKay wrote these lines. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot. Like men will face the murderous cowardly pack, pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. McKay's words were entered into the congressional record as an example of the dangerous new ideas of young black men. It must have seemed dangerous to the nation's leaders the blacks spoke of fighting back. Some blacks fought the system by joining the Communist Party. The communists had been active in the South. They had helped defend the Scots Bureau boys, nine young black men falsely accused of rape in Alabama. Among the well-known African-Americans connected to the Communist Party were the scholar W.E.B. Du Bois and the actor and singer Paul Robeson. During the 1930s, the communists organized committees to seek help for the needy. An organizer named Angelo Herndon was arrested and charged with promoting revolution. He recalled his trial. They questioned me in great detail. Did I believe the bosses and government ought to pay insurance to unemployed workers? The Negro should have complete equality with white people. Did I feel that the working class could run the mills and mines and government? That it wasn't necessary to have bosses at all? I told them I believed all of that and more. Herndon spent five years in prison before the Supreme Court ruled that the law he had been arrested for breaking was unconstitutional. To the establishment, men like Herndon were signs of a frightening new mood among blacks. That mood was militancy, a willingness to fight. Toward civil rights. President Harry Truman knew that the United States had to do something about race for two reasons. One reason was to calm the frustrated black people of the United States. The other reason had to do with America's image in the world. Non-white people around the world were accusing the United States of being a racist society. America's Cold War with the Soviet Union was on and each side wanted to gain influence around the globe but the poor civil rights record of the United States could hold it back in world politics. Truman created a Committee on Civil Rights in 1946. The committee recommended laws against lynching and against racial discrimination in jobs and voting. Congress took no action. However, Truman did order the armed forces to desegregate or end racial separation. It took 10 years, but the military was finally integrated with blacks and whites no longer separated. The nation's public schools remained segregated until courageous Southern blacks took on the Supreme Court in a series of lawsuits. In 1954, in a decision called Brown v. Board of Education, the court ordered the nation's public schools to, so to stop the separate but equal treatment of children separated by race. The court's big decision sent a message around the world the U.S. government had outlawed segregation, but change came slowly. Ten years later, more than three-fourths of the school districts in the South were still segregated. For Blacks, progress wasn't fast enough. In the early 1960s, Black people rose in rebellion all over the South. By the late 1960s, there were wild uprisings in a hundred northern cities, too. What triggered this angry revolt? A 43-year-old black woman named Rosa Parks sat down one day in the white section of a city bus. She had long been active in the NAACP, which was determined to challenge segregated seating on Montgomery buses. She was arrested. Montgomery's blacks called a mass meeting. They boycotted the city buses, refusing to ride. Instead, they walked or organized carpools. The city was losing a lot of income from bus fares. It arrested, a, it arrested a hundred of the boycott leaders. 
white segregationists turned to violence. They exploded bombs in four black churches. They fired a shotgun through the front door of the home of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a minister who helped lead the boycott. But the black people of Montgomery kept up the boycott, and in, and in November 1956, the Supreme Court made segregation on local bus lines illegal. Martin Luther King preaches nonviolence. At a meeting during the boycott, Martin Luther King showed the gift of speech making that would soon inspire millions of people to work for racial justice. He said, we have known humiliation, we have known abusive language, we have been plunged into the abyss of oppression, and we decided to raise up only with the weapon of protest. We must use the weapon of love. We must have compassion and understanding for those who hate us. King called on African Americans to, to practice nonviolence, to seek justice without doing harm to others. This message won him followers among whites as well as blacks. Yet some blacks thought the King's message was too simple. Some of those who oppressed them, they believed, would have to be bitterly fought. Still, in the years after the Montgomery bus boycott, Southern blacks stressed nonviolence. One nonviolent movement started in 1960, when four first-year students at an African-American college in North Carolina decided to sit down at a drugstore lunch counter where only whites ate. The store wouldn't serve them, but they did not leave. They came back, joined by others, day after day, to sit at the counter. Sit-ins spread to other, southern, other southern, southern cities. The sit-iners experienced violence, but they inspired more than 50,000 people, mostly blacks, some whites, to join the demonstrations in 100 cities. By the end of 1960, lunch counters were open to blacks in many places. Freedom Riders and the Mississippi Summer. For a long time, it had been illegal to segregate people by race during long distance travel, but the federal government had never enforced the law in the South where blacks and whites were still kept apart on interstate buses. In the spring of 1961, a group of black and white protesters set out to change that. These freedom riders got on a bus in Washington, DC, bound for New Orleans. They never reached New Orleans. Riders were beaten in South Carolina, and a bus was set on fire in Alabama. Segregationists attacked the riders with fists and iron bars. The Southern police did nothing. Neither did the federal government, even though FBI agents watched the violence. Young people who had taken part in the sit-ins formed the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. They organized another group of Freedom Riders who were attacked by a mob of whites and later arrested. By this time, the Freedom Riders were in, all, were in the news all over the world. Young black children joined demonstrations across the South. In Albany, Georgia, a small town where the atmosphere of slavery lingered, blacks held marches and mass meetings. After arresting protesters, the police chief took their names. One protester was a boy about nine years old. What's your name? The police chief asked. The boy looked straight at him and answered, freedom, freedom. A new generation was learning how to demand its rights. The SNCC and other civil rights groups worked in Mississippi to register blacks for voting and to organize protests against racial injustice. They called on young people from other parts of the country to help, to come south for a Mississippi summer. Facing increasing violence and danger, in June of 1964, they asked President Lyndon B. Johnson and Attorney General Robert Kennedy for federal protection. They got no answer. Soon afterward, three civil rights workers, one black and two white, were arrested in Philadelphia, Mississippi. After being let out of jail late at night, they were beaten with chains and shot to death. Later, the sheriff, deputy sheriff, and others went to jail for the murders. Black Power. The national government had refused, again and again, to defend Blacks against violence. Still, the uproar about civil rights and the attention that it drew around the world made Congress pass some civil rights laws, including the Civil Rights Act of 1964. These laws promised much, but were ignored or poorly enforced. Then, in 1965, a stronger Voting Rights Act made a difference in Southern voting. In 1952, only 20% of Black people who could vote had registered to do so. But by 1968, 60% were registered, the same percentage as white voters. The federal government was trying to control an explosive situation without making any basic changes. It wanted to channel Black anger into traditional places, such as voting booths and quiet meetings with official support. One meeting like that had taken place in 1963, when Martin Luther King 
led a huge march on Washington, D.C. The crowd thrilled to King's magnificent I Have a Dream speech, but the speech lacked the anger that many Black people felt. John Lewis was a young SNCC leader who had been arrested and beaten many times in the fight for racial equality. Lewis wanted the meeting to express some outrage, but its leaders wouldn't let him criticize the national government. Two months later, a black militant named Malcolm X gave his view on the, of the march on Washington. He said, the Negroes were out there in the streets. They were talking about how they were going to march on Washington. It was the grassroots out there in the street. It scared the white men to death, scared the white power structure in Washington, D.C. to death. This is what they did with the March on Washington. They joined it, became part of it, took it over. It became a picnic, a circus, nothing but a circus with clowns and all. It was a takeover. They told the Negroes what time to hit town, where to stop, what signs to carry, what song to sing, what speech they could make, and what speech they couldn't make, and then told them to get out of town by sundown. People were still exploding bombs in black churches, killing children. The new civil rights laws weren't changing the basic conditions of life for black people. Nonviolence had worked in the Southern Civil Rights Movement, partly by turning the country's opinion against the segregationist South. But by 1965, half of all African Americans lived in the North. There were deep problems in the ghettos, the poor black neighborhoods of the nation's cities. In the summer of 1965, the ghetto of Watts, Los Angeles, erupted with rioting in the streets and with looting and firebombing of stores. 34 people were killed. Most of them were black. More outbreaks took place the next year. In 1967, the biggest urban riots in American history broke out in black ghettos across the land. 83 people died of gunfire, mostly in Newark, New Jersey, and Detroit, Michigan. Martin Luther King was still respected, but new heroes were replacing him. Black power was their slogan. They distrusted progress that was given a little at a time by white people. They rejected the idea that whites knew what was best for black people. Malcolm X was black power's chief spokesman. He was assassinated in 1965 while giving a speech. After his death, millions read the book that he wrote about his life. He was more influential in death than during his lifetime. Another spokesman was Huey Newton of the Black Panthers. This organization had guns and said that blacks should defend, defend themselves. King was growing concerned about problems that the civil rights laws didn't touch, problems of poverty. He also began speaking out against a war the United States was fighting in the Asian nation of Vietnam. King said, we are spending all of this money for death and destruction and not nearly enough money for life and constructive development. The FBI tapped King's private phone conversations, blackmailed him, and threatened him. A U.S. Senate report of 1976 would say that the FBI tried to destroy Dr. Martin Luther King. But destruction came when an unseen marksman shot King to death as he stood on the balcony outside his hotel room in Memphis, Tennessee. The killing of King brought new urban violence. African Americans saw that violence and injustice against them continued. Attacks on black people were endlessly repeated in the history of the United States, coming out of a deep well of racism in the national mind. But there was something more. Now the FBI and police were targeting militant black organizers, such as the Black Panthers. Was the government afraid that black people would turn their attention from issues such as voting to something more dangerous, such as the question of wealth and poverty? If poor whites and blacks united, large-scale class conflict could become a reality. But if some blacks were invited into the power system, they might turn away from class conflict. So leaders of non-militant black groups visited the White House. White-owned banks began helping black businesses. Newspapers and televisions started showing more black faces. These changes were small, but they got a lot of publicity. They also drew some young black leaders into the mainstream. In 
By 1977, more than 2,000 African Americans held public office in southern cities. It was a big advance, but it was still less than 3% of all elective offices, although blacks made up 20% of the total population. More blacks could go to universities, to law and medical school. Northern cities were busing children back and forth to integrate their schools, but none of this was helping the unemployment, poverty, crime, drug addiction, and violence that were destroying the black lower class in the ghettos. At the same time, government programs to aid African Americans seemed to favor blacks over whites. When poor whites and poor blacks competed for jobs, housing, and the miserable schools that the government provided for all the poor, new racial tension grew. No great black movement was underway in the mid-1970s, yet a new black pride and awareness had been born, and it was still alive. What form would it take in the future? Just like Spencer said earlier, a lot of the themes discussed in this chapter are all too relevant and similar in many ways to the Black Lives, La Black Lives Matter movement and the protests against police brutality that have been happening in our communities and in cities across our country. Now that we've read through the chapter, I'd like to pose a few reflection questions for you to think about. In what ways do you think our country has progressed in prov providing and protecting the civil rights of Black Americans since the 1950s and 1960s? In what ways do you think that we still have a lot of work to do? Were there any parts of the chapter that felt particularly similar to some of the events that you've been reading or hear about, hearing about over the last couple of weeks? And have you or has someone you know participated in a protest, rally, or march? What was your experience? Or if they shared their experience with you, what did you learn from that? I encourage you to take some time now to sit and think and reflect about these questions and then maybe write them down in a journal talk about them with a friend or family member, or share your thoughts with us on our Flipgrid, which you can find using flip code Civic Nebraska 1247 We'd love to hear from you. See you soon on Civic U.